Hi, I'm Colin Dart. Have you had your lateral flow device test? I have, yes, it was negative. <laughs> um, <laughs> Hi, I'm Sarah. I'm with Digital and Tech Exeter. Hi, thank you very much. I'm Colin Dart. I am the Set Squared Exeter Technology Manager. Where are we? So we are currently in the University of Exeter Enterprise Zone Incubator. Amazing. So um, this space is home to the business acceleration team, and the support that we deliver to high tech, um, high growth businesses as they start their journey. It's exciting. It's really, it's such a nice space. Um, so, and what do you do as part of this? Because you're in the space and you know a ton about it and you've been involved with, I think, the whole process of everything for a while. So, how do you fit into the, uh, this space? Okay, so I'm the technology manager um, for Set Squared Exeter. So, Set Squared Exeter is, um, as I said, the business acceleration team. Um, well, our part is anyway. So, what we do is um, we try to engender an entrepreneurial spirit um, and then provide the building blocks for succeeding as a company as you start. So we do this in many, many different ways. Um, everything from our kind of student startup team, trying to teach students the kind of entrepreneurial um, nuances, um, as well as getting started with ideas such as market research, validation, and so on. When they come to us, um, they tend to be, um, have, a, have a bit more of a formed idea. Um, and with that formed idea comes the challenge of trying to work out what to do next. Um, and often the barrier is that they don't know. Um, they have a, maybe a solution to a problem um, or they have a problem with no solution. Um, so my job in the first instance is to help validate um, and help people try new technologies. So um, it may be everything from AR and VR um, all the way through to 3D fabrication or maybe even just understanding things like software packages that they might need to learn to if they're going to scale. Mm -hmm. um, we do that in um, multiple different ways. Um, we hold workshops and events, just introducing concepts to people um, at a kind of academic and practical level, mm -hmm. so theory and, and practice. Um, the events tend to kind of bring people together so they can talk to each other, um, which is a really key part of all of this. Um, and then we really get down to the nitty gritty. So that's the kind of what do I do? So. The technology manager is there to assess the kind of what's needed next. So we take a founder and we say, okay, what do you know already? Um, what are you trying to solve? What do you need to know to get there, mm -hmm. um, to get to a solution? And with that, we can start to plan a bit of a technology strategy. And that's, you know, 12 months of intensive support mm -hmm. um, alongside all of the other support that Set Squared offers. Oh, wow, that's great. So what I'm hearing is that you basically get to play with tech all day. That's yes. what I'm hearing. <laughs> okay, cool. That's and, that done then. <laughs> and tell people how they can play with tech as well. No, it's great though, because <laughs> I, I think introducing people to different concepts that they haven't thought about means actually that they get a lot of worth out of their time with you. And I think that's sort of one of the keys of how an acceleration program can be successful or must be successful because yeah. there's no other way except for exposing people to new ideas and new concepts and new ways of doing stuff. Yeah. Um, and I have many questions, don't you worry. <laughs> but um, can you quickly just maybe delve into why you do what you do? Because obviously it'll take a certain type of person to be good at and being a technology manager, I wouldn't be a good fit. I would not. Um, but that's why I also don't do it. But like, what, how, how have you come to this particular job and position? And, and maybe what do you really enjoy about it most? Yeah, of course. So um, first and foremost, um, it's a parental role. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my psyche, and I would happily say that the rest of the team are, are very similar, is we are ones that that want to see um, the people that we're supporting, you know, fly off and, and do great things. You know, we don't mind if we're, you know, they never mention us again. Um, <laughs> but what we what we really want to see is, is success in these people because their success is our success. And in terms of why I do what I do, um, it quite simply brings me great satisfaction to see someone that might not have been able to achieve their dream without us, Mm. and hoping that whatever we give them, even if it's small or a big influence, that that's the difference, that that's what gets them to their goal and that they can then flourish 
um, you know, and often we find that the people we're supporting, I'm not going to say they're not happy where they are, but there's something missing. You know, they're, they're trying to do something new. Mm. And if we can help them make that transition and make it a success, that's just an amazing feeling. Mm. Um, in terms of how I got here, it's a, a long charted history of doing the same thing, but becoming less commercial each time. Okay. So um, I started off as a, des a designer um, and I specialized in helping young companies to create an identity mm. and a brand so that they can, again, very similar story, so that they can get to the next stage and seem professional and feel professional. From that point onwards, it really became just keep stepping to the point where you feel you can make a bigger and bigger difference. Um, and that it ceases to be the, okay, I've helped this person win a contract um, or get some sales. And it starts to be, I've helped this person set themselves up for the rest of their life, mm. um, which is a big overblown statement. <laughs> but I'm, I would be happy to say that that's, that is the case for some of our people. So safe to say that that is also then your favorite part of the role, to see them succeed, to see them actually achieve things that they didn't think they were able to because they felt stuck maybe when they came to you. Um, that is a really fab favorite part to have. I mean, that's really great. In general, what skills or key skills would people need in order to sort of start a career in, in te managing technology and ideally, you know, playing all day with new inventions and getting yep. people to interact? So it's called many things. I mean, technology manager is one. Or I've heard evangelist and, and okay. so on and so forth. Um, there's, there's a few key elements to the role and they tend to be the soft skills. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as I said before, I'm not an expert in, well, I'm in many fields at least. <laughs> Um, but that's the key. You don't need to be. Um, the key thing about being a technology manager is one is learning to be a good facilitator, um, a good networker and have excellent liaison skills. Mm. You know, what you're doing essentially is spending all day with people, listening to them um, and gaining the right amount of data from that conversation. So really, really finding out what, what the obstacles are, where their skills base is and so on and so forth. Beyond that, it's about then connecting them with the right resources. Now, sometimes that's us, and that's a really easy win, but most of the time it's not. Um, it's bringing in other people, be it peers, academia, the industry, people that they might be able to partner with, people that might be able to teach them. And getting the right people in compared to just getting someone in is a big difference. Mm -hmm. So understanding is key. And I think the biggest part, and I thought about this um, <laughs> beforehand, um, you have to take it personally. Mm. You know, a technology manager in this sense, um, but in a vast amount of sense, is all about supporting people. But it's other people's dreams, or it's other people's processes and jobs and, and tasks. But you have to take it personally. Mm. Because essentially what you're saying is, I'm not an expert, but I'm going to find out. Um, and that can often take a lot of effort, your own personal effort. Um, it can take you know, a bit of a learning curve for yourself to go away and say, I'm going to find out enough about this thing mm. that I can come back to you and give you the best advice. And if you don't take it personally, that's not going to happen. So it becomes mm. a bit of a personal mind, you know, coaching element mm. to it. So you basically become an advocate for them as well in other spaces and actually going, oh, I need an answer for this person. This is their problem. Like, do you know about a solution? And then yeah. basically not pushing, but pursuing it until there is a good enough answer and the right answer, if there is one. You have to provide as, as much passion for them as they're already putting mm. into their project. Um, and I'm not going to say you're not of use to them if you don't, mm. but you become of best use for them if you are. Of course, of course. So as we're thinking about, you know, uh, one of the things that uh, we're seeing with the pandemic, and I'm sure you've seen as well, is that people are using the space and this disruption either out of choice or because of their situational changes to completely reinvent themselves. Mm. Um, and one of the things that we're very passionate about um, is obviously encouraging people into STEM businesses because yeah. this is where we work, this is where we uh, find our joy. Um, how do you think we can encourage more people to make the step into digital tech, all of the other stems um, <laughs> and and do you think that there is maybe also opportunities that weren't there before the pandemic from your view 
if you talk to anyone um, that deals with people that come to the tech industry at a later time, what you realize is that they haven't had the grounding in kind of school and college age. Mm -hmm. um, the biggest barrier to um, the STEM industry at the moment is that it's patchy. Um, if you go to a primary school, secondary school or college, um, and then go to another equivalent in another area, how they approach technology learning is all different. Mm -hmm. You know, even within Exeter, um, you know, the core centre, we see schools that are highly technological, technological and they approach it as part of all of their learning. And then the others that have the traditional, once a week we have an IT lesson. Um, and it's a vast gap. So I think what we can do as a, a kind of a community is start to make that kind of opportunity to learn about the STEM arena more visible and more accessible to everyone. So to then carry on as to all those people that maybe find themselves having an opportunity, the worst case scenario is they say, I have an opportunity, but I don't know where to go. Mm -hmm. um, so it's visibility, it's accessibility. Is there a workshop that I can attend without paying, without having to be part of an institution or a professional body, without having to know someone else? Mm. Is, this, is this stuff visible and accessible to me and at the right level? Mm -hmm. So am I able to see introductory content to then take it further so that we can ignite passion and then further thought about what they were thinking about. Mm -hmm. And that's not always technological. Sometimes it's, um, you know, we see them around things like demo nights where you can stand up on a stage and say, I have an idea. And everyone else can say, that's a great idea. You should really think about that further. Mm -hmm. Why don't you talk to, because they're running an event, mm -hmm. you know, and that's, that's where the community can really drive that, mm -hmm. that in. How, why do we think, or what makes Exeter the perfect home for tech and digital people uh, and businesses? So the, our, the situation we're in currently is that we get lots of influx of people moving out of bigger cities where they've experienced the less than optimal pandemic um, and they just need to be out. And obviously we have the space here, we have, um, we have this beautiful surrounding we have got excellent acceleration programs <laughs> but um what makes Ex what 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 difference does exeter make do you think for t digital and tech people so i think um i think first and foremost exeter has always been a good place mm -hmm. um but it's a bit of a, a secret um a best kept secret um i think geography has maybe stopped people thinking about exeter for a long time you know it's a long way away from the the large cities of um of this country however with better communication links and better transport links and so on, that's almost a moot point now. Mm -hmm. And then once that's the case and we can work from anywhere, um, you know, what you've got to look at is what resources are there for me to start a business or continue a business? And also as an individual, where do I want to be? Mm -hmm. Now you said it a little bit there, so yeah. it, and it would be a complete remiss to, to avoid the fact that it is a beautiful part of the world. <laughs> you know, um, I'm not born and bred Exeter. Mm. Um, I've lived around, I've lived in London, I've lived in other places. But the key thing for me was as soon as I came here, maybe through circumstance, I've never left and that's choice. Mm. Because why would you want to? Yes. You know, we have the moors, we have the sea, the cities are nice, it's clean, it's a great place to raise a family, all of those things. So it really becomes a question of, can I do what I wanted to do in Exeter? Mm. And the answer to me has always been yes. Um, we've got the University of Exeter, which, which does a couple of things. Um, it's not just a great university for people to come and study. What it means is there's a constant stream of talented people that are graduating and are able to do work. Mm. So if I wanted to start a business here and I was worried about access to talent um, or who was going to take forward the company if I grew, you know, that, that answers that question. You know, they've got great computer science um, departments, engineering departments. Um, they're really high on the agenda for some very hot topics. You know, I think um, I might get this stat slightly wrong, but I know quite a lot of the top 10 climate scientists in the world exist in Exeter. Mm. Um, and, you know, that kind of access to people who are being taught by that level of academia is, is impressive. If I wanted to say, start a revolutionary company, um, I can go to the university and I can use one of their many projects mm. that are available for people to access, assuming they're eligible, and I can undergo the kind of research studies that then underpin what I'm going to do next. And that's a big, big deal for innovators. Um, but it's not just Exeter. Um, we've also got Plymouth University down the road. So, you know, mirror all of that sentiment, but in the marine sector. And we've got Cornwall around the corner, 
um, which has a, a vast amount of natural resource and also projects running as well. Mm. So wherever you come into tech, be it from one particular discipline or another, there's going to be someone in this region that can help you from a research, innovation, skills, talent point of view. And I don't think you can say that about many places in the UK. I think you're completely right. One thing that was uh, really surprising to me is as well that there is a community of people. So um, Digital and Tech Exeter obviously support um, that community and are active in it. But there is just among tech people a real excitement about what they do and they do it out of passion. Yeah. So it's not just people behind laptops and computers coding, but there is a real diversity and that diversity, I think, as you said, is found in the Southwest as well. And I think maybe also geographically, it's always not been really a thing, but I think because people are reevaluating as well where they stand in life and what is important to them, um, it's going to grow further and actually we're going to get a lot more talent coming here and they're already coming. It's really positive as well. <laughs> um, and I've got to reiterate that. Um, the landscape, everything from, you know, tech on the ground, you mm. know, be it, you know, people working in the tech industry to people trying to change it, mm. to people trying to start businesses. Uh, there's a real sense that this area is one where people come out of choice. Yeah. And because they come out of choice, they want to better the region. And because of that, the communities aren't there because of competitiveness or trying to undermine or trying to um, get into a market. Those communities exist because those people want to help each other to create a better environment. And places like Tech Exeter, Digital Exeter, Tech Southwest, mm. you know, all of these kind of things, whenever, whenever we speak to those people and whenever we're speaking to the other people who are members of those um, networks, it's always a positive conversation. Mm. And that's... And again, you can't say that about everywhere. Absolutely. So if you were to choose Exeter again, if you had the choice, blank slate, I, I can do do over. Do you think you would choose Exeter again, having having maybe heard mumbles about how great it is? Um, absolutely. Um, again, I think possibly it would have been a harder choice in the past, mm -hmm. um, and that's visibility. Yeah. Um, Exeter is... Um, is a great place, and I think a lot of people wanted to keep it a secret. Mm. Um, I think if you if you hear people talking about Exeter, it becomes top of the list in terms of choice, or at least in terms of places to look at. Um, you know, the the geography is unavoidably beautiful, mm. um, and I think if you were to choose anywhere to live, it would probably be somewhere like here, mm -hmm. and then you would try and work out if you can. Absolutely. Whereas I think now, I think that question is less of an issue. And it's now, do I want to live here? Yes. Well, I know I can. Exactly. Everyone is telling me I can. So this incubator, the Set Squared mm -hmm. Exeter incubator, um, is it's this room is not the incubator. The incubator okay. is the Science Park Centre. Um, so we are the acceleration services that drive that incubator. Interestingly enough, on top of the building. On top of the building, of course we are. <laughs> so um, the rationale is that the Science Park as a whole um, is the... It's the place where um, the STEM industry can grow in this area. Um, it's the place where you'll be able to cross-pollinate. Um, it's the place where you can share talent and ideas. You can build a home and you can see a pathway for that home all the way through your scale. Mm. Um, the Science Park has everything from what you see here, which is informal kind of drop-in places where you can undergo things like the accelerator, through to hot desking, small offices, big offices, floors of buildings and then eventually buildings you know and that's a really key thing about places like science parks in general but definitely here is that if you want to innovate if you want to scale you can come here stay here and not have to see that as a barrier to your scale you're not having to think about where you're going to move to next how much it's going to cost it's it can be all mapped out for you mm. so what does the science park then give you by being here, I mean, one, it's right on the M5, it's near Exeter Airport, it's a short hop away from a train station, it's got great cycle and walk links into town, you know, it's incredibly accessible. If you walk around here, um, I was only speaking to someone today, this is a beautiful place to work. You know, it's very green, there's ancient trees in the field next door, you know, it, you can see the estuary, it's a wonderful place to be anyway, when the sun is shining at least. <laughs> um, but also there's a real sense that um, it doesn't have to be too much hard work to make a community here. Mm. 
Hmm. You can walk down the corridor and you can see people that work in vastly different arenas, but they'll have an interesting conversation with you and it will spark an idea. You know, it can be someone that works in photonics, speaking someone works in agriculture, but they might have something in the middle. Um, and, you know, be it sitting in the cafe and speaking to those people, having a coffee in an incubator, even just making your tea at a kitchenette is a really important part of that. So that when you grow and scale, you also know that those people are still here, but they're new, fresh people. Um, and that that's just part of that kind of churn of community. <laughs> to be quite honest, there's not a lot of outtakes there. No. Probably don't know how much we missed in the middle there. <laughs> um, yeah, well, just of me though, so that's fine. It's, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. It's fine because you, you can cut it in, in another way. So you've got the sound and just put things like old clips from Rainbow or... <laughs> <laughs> the gummy bears. <laughs> <laughs> do, do, do. <laughs>